yeah so the last class we covered exodus and leviticus so today we will get into numbers and deuteronomy so uh, let's see what we can cover from the book of deuteronomy uh, from numbers of course first and then after the break we will cover deuteronomy now why is this book called numbers they could have chosen any number of titles for this particular book but why is it called numbers that is because the people were numbered they were someone counted the population uh, so that you know they these men who are 20 years and above can serve as soldiers and so they did a population count uh, they found out how many uh, people are available for their army because now they're going to be entering the promised land and god has promised them that they will have victory in all of their battles so now they are getting their army ready so they would have uh, done the count to find out how many persons are 20 years and above you know among the men uh, so that's that that's the why the first numbering was done but then you know if we are already familiar with the story of numbers we know what happens uh, the people disobey the lord and so because they disobey the lord the lord says fine you will not enter the land now and you will have to spend the next 40 years out in the wilderness and so um, that entire generation keeps roaming around in the wilderness because God does not give them permission to enter the land. And at the end of the 40 years, a second numbering is done when the new generation has now grown up and now they are in a, ready in a position to enter the land. So there are two numberings that take place in this particular book. Uh, so there are two population counts that are done to find out how many fighting soldiers they will have in their army all right so that's the reason why this book is named as numbers and um, the emphasis in this uh, book uh, is on those 40 years and it talks about all that they experienced all that they went through you know during those 40 years and we see a lot of verses in the book of numbers where repeatedly um, Moses says to them, you know, teach your children these things. That wording is repeated again and again. Uh, we find that in Numbers 4, 9, Numbers 6, verse 7. Uh, we find, um, you know, that theme uh, covered in um, Numbers chapter 11, um, Numbers chapter 32. In various places, um, Moses again and again says, Teach your children these things. Why? Why is that emphasis being laid? Because the generation whom God had chosen to enter into the promised land, they did not have the faith. They did not have the um, obedience and commitment level needed to obey the Lord and enter and take over. So they failed. So now at least they can teach their children and equip them in the things of God so that when the time comes, at least this generation will be able to enter and claim what belongs to them. So again and again, throughout the book of Moses, um, throughout, the, throughout the book of Numbers, Moses urges the people and says, teach your children these things. Let them learn these things. And you know, so that principle can be applied even today to us and our families. If we want our children, we want the next generation to walk in victory and be able to conquer the things that we are meant to conquer as a church, you know, and establish God's kingdom, we would have to teach our children these things. If we don't, then there will be no victory. So it is absolutely essential. And um, the book of Numbers stresses this again and again because one generation failed to achieve what had been promised. And now the hope is that at least the next generation will equip themselves, you know, to walk in confidently, you know, you know in, in, the, in, in faith. Uh, so coming to the structure of this book, the book of Numbers, uh, maybe we can divide it into uh, four, four main divisions. Chapters 1 to 9 uh, talks about the preparation this generation which God had hoped will enter. 
you know they are now making preparations getting ready to enter and uh, so um, it talks about that the men are chosen the men prepare themselves all that happens in chapters 1 to 9 and also this and this and this is a nice event which takes place the people together celebrate the second passover the first passover took place one year back in the land of egypt you know when the angel of death passes over their houses and does not enter and they are protected from judgment so that was the first passover now one year later they celebrate the second passover and now they are getting ready to enter into the promised land so all that's dealt with in the first nine chapters the second division i guess can be chapters 10 to 12 um so in chapters 10 to 12 we see the greed of the people the lack of faith of this generation uh, you know they the lord is providing them manna miraculously and they are not satisfied they say oh we are, we, we are tired of this manna we wish we had non veg and you know we have all of that grumbling no gratitude only grumbling and only lack of faith you know like as if god is somebody so evil uh, and uh, who doesn't care about them that that seems to be the uh, their attitude towards the lord so we see that in chapters 10 to 12 we also see miriam and aaron receiving correction um, you know if we have time we'll touch upon that later uh, so all that happens in chapters 10 to 12 the third main section i suppose can be chapters 13 to 19 in these chapters uh, we see the 12 spies being sent out uh, to to study the land and then they come back and they give their report as we all know uh, we have 10 spies who give a negative report only two of them exercise their faith and say yes what the lord has promised he will do for us okay so that would be in uh, chapters 13 to 19 and then we come to the last section which will be chapters 20 to 36 and um, in this section uh, one interesting story would be that of balak the king and the uh, person whom he hires to to speak curses upon the people balam balam is the prophet whom he hires in the hope that balam will be able to speak a curse on the people uh, of israel and stop them you know from flourishing uh, so that incident takes place uh, what else do we see uh, we see the second counting happening the second numbering takes place in 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 these chapters and of course we also see how moses is not allowed to enter into the promised land so these incidents take place in chapters 20 to 36 so this uh, is basically the division of this book um coming to a few things which are there in your uh, pdf how is jesus christ represented in this book of numbers uh he is represented as a in the in numbers 19 where it talks about a red heifer which was sacrificed so if you're using an english bible the, the term used over there is a red heifer which was sacrificed and that is pointing towards jesus christ who will sacrifice himself on our behalf what on earth is a heifer that's just basically a young cow which has not yet given birth to any calves so um, and it's reddish because its fur is reddish brown in color uh, so um, in numbers 19 that particular sacrifice which is talked about over there that is pointing towards jesus christ another um, representation of jesus christ which we see uh, would be in the rock you know um, out of which water comes out uh, so how is that a representation of christ uh, we would see the details for that in first corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 so maybe we could actually uh, read that particular verse uh, so people who are online if anyone would like to unmute and uh, read out for us first corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 uh, that would be really nice so uh, could we have anyone online unmuting and reading out for us uh, 
and first corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 please and all of them drank the same spiritual water for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them and that rock was christ i think someone actually read out but then um it was not audible over here so fine we'll just have some student over here read out okay the you know when we come to the other verses um and uh, those of us who are online you know if you can just follow whatever verse i have mentioned you know in your own uh, books so right now if we could just have one person here uh, reading out for us first corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 please Check. so here uh, paul refers to the old testament story which is there in the book of numbers and he says uh, in the same way water came out of the rock for the israelites in the same way jesus christ is that rock for us today uh, out of him come the living waters which are able to uh, give us life but he takes it to an, uh, another level he doesn't just simply make a comparison and leave it at that he makes a comment about these people living in the time uh, you know uh, time of uh, the book of numbers and he says referring to those people referring to the israelites uh, he says they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and that rock was christ it talks about a spiritual cry uh, spiritual rock that was accompanying them that was there along with them in all of their journeys and all of their trials if you remember that first generation you know were always grumbling didn't trust the lord were never satisfied with what the lord provided had a very negative attitude and uh, so they would complain and say god is not providing water god is not providing non veg uh, why is god uh, doing this but then if you look over here paul is writing under the inspiration of the holy spirit and he says you know what that spiritual rock christ was accompanying them wherever they went they were not actually in any lack if they could have just asserted their faith and waited upon the lord in faith in his time he would have provided them with all the desires of their heart including non veg but they had no faith or trust in the lord they they refused to believe the character of god which they saw so many times he did miracles for them which were impossible he took care of them in a very beautiful and an elaborate manner but instead of remembering those events and understanding the character of our god they chose to um, you know criticize him and grumble against him but the truth is that jesus christ was there with them through all of their trials so you know we can choose not to be blind like these israelites when we are going through those times when we are craving for our non veg may not be something as light as non veg i mean there are you no know, more serious matters uh, so when we are going through those and we can literally feel the hunger you know of an answer to our problems and we feel like that god is not answering it is good to remember that there is a spiritual rock who is accompanying us and there are living waters that can be released for us but they will be released in his time according to his perfect time table are you and i people who will you know stand in faith and say yes lord i know that you are here with me and unlike those israelites who would not believe in your character i know who you are i know that you are faithful and i know that when the time comes without a moment's delay you will provide so i just have to keep fighting through in faith and if i do that when the time comes you the spiritual rock will provide what is required so the israelites failed in the test of faith you know which was placed before them but that does not have to happen to us you no know? so um um so we can learn from this 
another representation of Jesus Christ that we see um, would be the manna itself, which the people were being provided every day. Uh, uh, because John chapter 6, verses 31 to 33, it refers to this manna and it compares the manna with uh, Jesus, the bread of life. So in the same way, the manna was supernaturally given to them. It literally dropped down from heaven every day for them to collect and eat. In the same manner, Jesus is our bread of life. Um, so there was never a day where the Israelites had to say, oh my, today there's no, um, no supply of manna. Only on the Sabbath day, they were required to collect beforehand so that they will not do work on that day. That's all that was the requirement. But otherwise, every single day, the manna was available for them. In the same way, the bread of life, the one who helps us to live spiritually and be able to fight all the battles of this life, he is with us every day. And we have life in him. We can feed on him every single day. We don't have to wait for Sunday and then hold the wafer in our hand and say, oh, today my needs are being met. The bread of life is with us every single day. And he is with us in the form of the word, the Bible. And we can feed on those words because those words have the power to change our situations. So whether bread, physical bread can you know, satisfy our needs or not, one thing we can be sure, the spiritual bread this word of God, there's great power in it. When we feed on it and we choose to trust in it, we are strengthened in our inner man and we will be able to hold on and we will see our victory coming through. So uh, the bread of life um, uh, is Jesus and he is compared to the manna which those people had. Now when those people were given the manna, what was their comment? They said, we are tired of this miserable food. That was the actual words which they used. We'll look at the verse a little later, but that's the wording which they used. They spoke of the mana in a very derogatory manner and they said, oh, this mana, we are tired of this miserable food. What is our attitude to the bread of life today? Are we grateful for what Jesus Christ has done for us? I mean, we humans who would never have had access to God, now we have direct access to God because of this bread of life. And now he says, you know, ask of me and I will give you. So we can, we can take the word of God, depend on him in faith and see our life situations change. So um, uh, we should not be like the Israelites who had no appreciation for the manna that was being given to them. Instead, we should be people who will appreciate the bread of life, who's, who has, you know, sacrificed him, himself and said, now, because I have sacrificed myself, everything that you require for your life is there in me. Come to me, feed on me, trust in my word, and, you know, be enriched, grow. So what is our attitude today to the bread of life is a thought that, you know, we, we need to think. Um, another picture of uh, Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, and it, uh, it's very interesting that this particular picture, it comes out of Balaam's mouth. Balaam was not a follower of the living God. Uh, Balaam did not even want to go and give the prophecies, but God made him open his mouth and actually prophesy about Jesus Christ. And we find that in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. So maybe here in our class, if we could have someone read out Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. You really need to open up your Bibles and keep it open at numbers. You yeah, yeah. So verse 17 um, is a direct prophecy about Jesus Christ. And it says, a star shall come forth from Jacob. Um, you know, the rulers were referred to as stars uh, in the old, olden, uh, ancient times, you know, in, in their culture. So 
a star, a king will rise up from Jacob is what uh, Balaam prophesies. And of course, he also says it's not going to happen right now, but in the future, this is something that will take place is what he says. Um, so these are all some images of Jesus Christ that we find in the Old Testament. Um, coming to another symbol, um, you know, in the book of Numbers, which points towards Jesus Christ, we'll dwell a little longer on that. Um, that would be the bronze serpent. Now, um, it is in John that we see this reference. So maybe we can first read uh, the John passage and then look at the details. Uh, John chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. If someone could read out, John chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. Jesus speaks these words to people who are refusing to place their faith in him. And so he says to them, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to tell you about normal earthly things and you're not able to believe even that. Where will you start believing when I start actually revealing spiritual heavenly truths to you? So in that context, he says, whether you believe or not, a day is going to come. In the same way that bronze serpent was lifted up in the wilderness by Moses, in the very same manner, the Son of Man also will be lifted up. Not sure whether we dealt with this in our previous classes or not. The term Son of Man is taken from Daniel chapter 7, which talks about the Messiah. So that term Son of Man refers to the Messiah directly. So here he is saying, you know, uh, in the same way Moses lifted up the bronze snake, I too will be lifted up. The Son of Man will also be lifted up. He will be exalted in a higher position where everyone will see him and look up to him and choose whether they wish to trust him or not. The choice is theirs. There's no force. But he will lift himself up and reveal himself to them. And whether they wish to accept him or not will be uh, their choice. Now, uh, this is a strange comparison which Jesus uses for himself. Him, him comparing himself to a lamb sounds good in the sense lambs were sacrificed and so we know in the same way that you know that jesus also sacrificed himself but why on earth did he want to go and compare himself to a snake especially because the snake seems to have such negative connotations uh, in the jewish circles and also in christian circles uh, because of genesis chapter 3 where uh, you know, the uh, snake, um, uh, the devil who has come uh, in the form of a snake uh, is, is cursed. So a curse is placed on the snake indirectly because the curse is actually upon Satan. But because, you know, he comes through a snake, uh, the snake is symbolically cursed. So we see that. So why would Jesus choose to compare himself with a snake? Uh, so just for us to kind of get a get some clarity regarding that, there are two answers that are generally given. One would be more a cultural reason, and it would have made sense to the Israelites in the wilderness. Because you see, they had come from an Egyptian culture. Um, they had gone into Egypt as a holy people, you know, with the, with the help of Joseph. But then after that, they forgot their God. They even forgot the name of their God. They began to follow the Egyptian gods and live, you know, in the way the Egyptians are living. And for the Egyptians, you know, as you may be aware, the snake was very important. If you have seen absolutely any, you know, clip art online of uh, pharaohs uh, or, you know, any paintings and all that, you'll see the pharaohs sitting over there with that, you know, um, crown on his head. And what do you have sticking out over here, right in the center of his forehead? Exactly. So, uh, you know, uh, snakes were very significant for those people in their culture. Um, the pharaoh would wear that particular crown with that particular symbol because in their culture, they believed 
that the snakes were uh, divine guardians. Uh, so they would guard the king and his throne and grant him good health and all of that. So that was their belief system. And uh, so now here, um, you know, uh, God instructs Moses and says, uh, you know, when the when the people are grumbling against God, as usual, you know, that was the that is a really bad thing about that particular generation. So in Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 to 9 is where we have some of the details. And the people are grumbling. And this is basically where they uh, you know, pass a comment on the divine mana. Uh, they say they, uh, in um, Numbers 21, verse uh, 8, I think, is where they say, there is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food, is what they say. And when the Lord hears them say that, he sends snakes among them. The people start getting bitten by these poisonous snakes. They all begin to die. Many, many people start dying. And so at that time, Moses, you know, cries out to God and says, Lord, please have mercy on my people. Please don't punish them. And so God hears, you know, Moses cry. And the Lord says, all right, prepare a bronze snake. Place it on the top of a pole. If anyone goes over there and looks at that snake, they will be cured of the poisonous bite. It will not kill them, you know, so they, their life will be saved. And um, so at that time, um, these people who were familiar with the Egyptian gods, and now those Egyptian gods are not there to deliver them. They are dying and nothing is being done for them. So God, on the other hand, he says, the serpent which I am placing will be able to provide healing. So there's a contrast drawn between the Egyptian uh, snakes, the snake gods, if you can say, uh, yeah, the Egyptian snake uh, gods that those people worshipped, and the living God who, uh, you know, uh, actually can provide deliverance and healing. So in what way is the comparison being made? We could maybe say, you know, it's like as if God is saying, um, okay, you people are what worshippers of bulls. You know what? I'm a better bull, a greater bull, the ultimate bull. In the same way, you know, are you people worshippers of goats? You know what? These goats are nothing. I am the actual goat. So it's something like that, you know. So the, there's a contrast drawn between the Egyptian gods, which are fake, and uh, so uh, they cannot heal, they cannot deliver. On the other hand, we have this bronze serpent, which Yahweh has uh, prepared. And that, if they look upon it, the people will receive healing. So there's a contrast drawn between what the living God can do. And he's showing the people very clearly that the Egyptian gods can do nothing for them. They can provide no kind of deliverance. Now, that's just the cultural significance which would have come across to the people in the wilderness. But then when we look in the New Testament, we see a deeper, greater significance in this bronze serpent. Uh, what do I mean? You know, because now we, we are so familiar with what Jesus Christ did on the cross, and we have been taught in detail about that in all the epistles. So we know that there's a connection between Genesis 3 and what Jesus Christ did. So in Genesis 3, the snake was cursed. And in the New Testament, Jesus says, you know, I mean, in, in the New Testament, we are told that Jesus became a curse for us. Now, that would be in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Uh, if someone could read out for us, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. If someone could read out Galatians 3.13. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, curse is everyone who is hung on a tree. I had Anusha reading online because I can see the you know icon. Uh, but yeah, it, the noise, the sound doesn't carry through for us here. 
so yes, Man. thanks Anusha. And I don't know your name, but I'll thank you later once I know your name. <laughs> so, okay. So Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. How did he redeem us from the curse of the law? By becoming a curse for us. So in the same way that snake was cursed in Genesis 3, in the same way Jesus Christ chooses to become that snake and become a curse for us. By becoming a curse for us, he chooses to exalt himself. He could have exalted himself as king. He could have exalted him as conqueror. But he chooses to humble himself and become a curse for us on our behalf. Become that cursed snake on our behalf to carry that curse for us so that we will not be cursed, so that we will enjoy the blessings of God. So there's a much deeper significance, which the Israelites at that time in the wilderness would not have caught. But then now we who are in New Testament times, we are able to understand the greater comparison that can be drawn between that bronze snake. You know, so that curse which was supposed to come upon all the Israelites who were grumbling and calling manna as a miserable food, those people, the curse which was supposed to come upon them, rather it was placed on the bronze serpent. And rather, and in, and in, in exchange, they were given healing, they were given deliverance. But there was something which those Israelites needed to do. They would have to actually, you know, once you're bitten and you're in a painful state and you are dying, you will have to assert your faith and say, yes, even though I'm in this condition, I'm going to drag myself to that pole wherever, wherever it is. I'm assuming it maybe it was placed in the center of the camp. I'm going to go all the way over there and look upon it because I really believe that healing will come if I look at it. So they would have had to take an act, uh, you know, a step of faith. There might have been some of them who would have said, I'm already bitten. I'm anyway dying. Where's the point in going over there? What's going to happen if I go and look at a bronze serpent? You know, in what way will it help? That may have been the attitude of some of the people, but some others chose to take that step of faith and look upon that bronze serpent. And it says in the scriptures that those who looked upon the bronze serpent in those days, they were healed. Now, in the same way, today we all have a choice. Will we choose to place our faith in this Jesus who has been exalted, the Son of Man who has been exalted, who has been lifted high? Will Are we willing to place our trust in him? Or will we be like those foolish Israelites and say, oh, where's the point? You know, sir, Jesus Christ did something on the cross 2,000 years ago. Now, where's the point in my looking upon that? Will it help me in any way? If we have the attitude of those Israelites, it would not help. So, you know, uh, there, there are um, lessons that we can learn uh, from these Israelites regarding these matters. So that was regarding the bronze serpent and how, in what way it represents Jesus Christ. Um, I thought it would be good if we can touch upon that story about Miriam and Aaron. And we find, um, you know, some details regarding that in Numbers chapter 12. The actual uh, entire passage probably would go up to, I don't know, maybe 9 or 10. But maybe we can just look at, uh, if someone could read out for us, uh, Numbers chapter 12, uh, maybe verses 1 to 3. Yeah, at least verses 1 to 3. Uh, numbers 12, 1, 2, and 3. Yeah, so Moses, I mean, um, no details are given in any of the commentaries. So this might have been a second wife because we know that the first person he marries was the daughter of Jethro. So uh, this probably is a second wife uh, and uh, she seems to be from the um, Kushite background, which basically means somewhere in Egypt. Uh, which also basically means that she would be darker skinned uh, than these Israelite people who are more fair. Uh, so it's a different culture. And it looks like there must have been some kind of argument in the family regarding this matter. Moses wants to marry her and Miriam and Aaron are not happy with the idea and they do not want him to marry her. So 
when he goes ahead and marries her this is what they say they say in verse 2 has the lord spoken only through moses they asked hasn't he also spoken through us you know so it looks like as if there was a clash about whether it is god's will or not moses seems to have been very clear that it is god's will and he's only doing what god has permitted him to do on the other hand miriam and aaron are raising a doubt and they're saying uh, we don't think this is god's will there is god speaking only to you i'm sure he speaks even to us and we are very very convinced that this is not god's will so this is a very uh, relatable you know something that we can relate with these are issues you know everyday issues something comes up in the family and some members of the family say no 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 this is definitely not god's will and then another person says no no i think this is god's will so there's a kind of uh, uh, clash over here but uh, it says here the lord heard this you know it, it's it says that in verse 2 at the end of verse 2 and the lord heard this and then it puts in brackets you know the next phrase uh, which is your uh, the next sentence which is your verse 3 it says now moses was a very humble man more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth i mean this is literally the holy spirit giving this comment about moses so when miriam and aaron began to criticize and condemn him i think moses just kept quiet rather than get into a solid fight with them he just keeps quiet and he does not fight back and so god decides i am going to fight on behalf of moses i think this is very admirable there's a uh, quite a serious fight happening over here but moses chooses not to say anything he chooses to you know just say that yes what i did was god's will and leave it at that he does not get into arguments he does not get into fights he stays humble and trusts god to deal with this matter so god decides to act on his behalf um it says in um, verse 9 the anger of the lord burned against them uh, you know so the lord decides to take a step and this is what the lord says to miriam and aaron regarding moses um he says in uh, verse 6 he says you know generally when prophets when i'm talking to prophets i give them a vision or you know they, they hear about my, hear my voice regarding something and then they convey my message to other people but with moses i don't just give a vision i don't just know he doesn't just hear my i literally speak to him face to face that is his level that is his spiritual capacity and he and god also says about uh, him he says in verse 7 he is faithful in all my house so you people are judging someone who i speak with face to face and who has been faithful towards me to that level what right do you have to judge someone who has been that faithful towards me will he go against my will will he not take permission from me first before he does anything so who are you to judge you know so um here of course you know this lesson is generally applied to how we should not speak against uh, those in spiritual leadership but i think it can be applied to just about anyone who is not even in a leadership position because if they are being faithful to the lord and the lord is having this beautiful relationship with them you know it would be very dangerous to start pointing fingers at that person and start criticizing them and saying oh they have gone outside god's will or oh, the way they are doing that oh it's not right uh we are very casually light heartedly passing judgments but do we know the details of that person's relationship with god who knows how many hours they spend with the lord who knows how careful they are in following god's will we don't know any of the details and here we are pointing fingers it could make the lord very angry it's risky um there could be uh, you know things in our own life may not work out so well because we have put this barrier between us and god by pointing fingers at a godly person who is really trying very hard to follow god's will so it it, it actually damages us we are risking our uh, direct connection with god by you know harming somebody else whom god is very very pleased with so uh which is why in new test in the new testament we have a couple of verses which deal with this um uh, issue and very good words of advice 
The first, of course, would be Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Maybe we could read out that first. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Matthew is not difficult to find. It's the first book in the New Testament. Yeah, so here the word of warning that is given is, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. There's such a thing as merciful judgment and that there is uh, judgment which is without any mercy. It is cruel and heartless. So God says, be very careful how you are judging others. If you are being completely merciless and you know not even bothering to find out the details, I can be equally merciless in the way I judge you. So be very careful is what the Lord says. Uh, so um, we are told to be very careful in how we judge. And then there's this other verse, you know, which um, brings out a, uh, another detail. That would be John chapter 7, verses 23 and 24. So if we can have someone read out John chapter 7, uh, verses 23 and 24. Is someone reading out? English, may I? Yeah. So here, uh, Jesus has done a good thing. He has healed somebody. And then uh, you have these critics over here criticizing him because he did the healing on the Sabbath day. And Jesus gives a very valid piece of advice over here. He says, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. In that version, it says, you know, judge righteously. So don't just take one glance at a situation and say, ah, this is wrong. Think about it. You know, if Miriam and, and Aaron were really that concerned about the honor of God, they would have approached God regarding this matter and said, Lord, did you really give permission regarding this? Should we back off? They didn't ask the Lord. They didn't even bother going to him regarding this matter. They began their criticism, you know, without even consulting him. So it would be sensible for us, you know, if we are really concerned about some matter, and we feel that we are judging that person correctly, it would be good to go in prayer before God and say, Lord, I think this is serious. I think this person should not be doing this. But am I being wrong in the way I am judging this person? Allow the Lord to speak to you regarding that matter. And if the Lord, if you sense in your heart that you should just back off and keep quiet because you don't know enough details, it's better for you to not judge. So this is something that should be done carefully. You know, and um, uh, what is the result of this? God is angry and it says that Miriam develops leprosy as a result of that. So it, it was something serious in God's eyes. And when someone is being faithful and humble and following the Lord and someone criticizes them wrongly, it makes God angry. And God was angry enough to, you know, uh, bring leprosy upon Miriam. And Aaron then goes to Moses and cries out and says, please, you know, have mercy. Ask the Lord to heal her. And then, of course, she has to wait seven days. At the end of seven days, the healing is granted. So it's a serious matter about how we, uh, you know, uh, in how we interact with people. Better be careful not to judge too hastily. Better to do it prayerfully in a righteous manner. Go to the Lord and ask him whether what we are doing is right and allow him to give us some thoughts and ideas regarding that matter without just simply blindly criticizing and condemning people. Um, so I thought maybe that could be one useful learning. Um, we don't have time now, but you know we could always address questions after the break. So online, if anyone wants to raise a hand. Uh, oh, yeah, but I'm unable to hear your um, voices, right? 
uh, today. I mean, this is just a temporary thing only for today. Uh, so next time onwards, there will not be any technical issues. Uh, so today, you know, if you have a question, if you could type that in the chat, please, uh, because after the break, you know, I can address those particular questions. And here in the class, yes, we have a question. It's so nice when we have questions. It just, you know, everybody wakes up and starts listening. So it helps. Yeah, go ahead. Question is only about the assignment. I'll explain that uh, later because it doesn't apply to the online students. Oh, yeah, someone in the, in the online thing had asked about the assignment which was mentioned at the beginning of the class. This has got nothing to do with the online students. Uh, this is, you know, uh, purely for um, the people who are here in the physical class. All right. So, um, uh, yeah, you can uh, go ahead for your break now, uh, but please come back on time. Thank you.